As of this week, the FBI's investigation into the anthrax attacks of 2001 is officially closed. The verdict? Bruce Ivins, the Fort Dietrich microbiologist who committed suicide in the summer of 2008, after months of FBI harassment, was the lone gunman. And yet, as the FBI surely knows, and as everyone who has been following the case closely knows, there is virtually no chance that Bruce Ivins acted alone if he was involved at all. But hey, case closed anyway, folks. Welcome back to Collateral. <laughs> Think of a number between one and 10, but don't tell me. <laughs> is it anthrax? <laughs> more than eight years since the anthrax-laced letters were sent in the autumn of 2001. Seven letters in all, five mailed to corporate news agencies, and two to Democratic Senators Patrick Leahy and Tom Daschle. Twenty-two people in all were infected, and in five cases, people died. In those eight years, the FBI has never produced decisive evidence connecting anyone to the attacks. This despite the fact that the Amerithrax investigation, as it was dubbed, was the largest investigation in the Bureau's history, with more than 9,000 interviews conducted over four continents and over 6,000 subpoenas issued. Now, you may recall the FBI spent years pursuing its case against a man named Stephen Hatfill, named a so-called person of interest early in the investigation by then Attorney General John Ashcroft. I have had nothing to do in any way, shape, or form with the mailing of these anthrax letters. For his part, Hatfield always denied any involvement whatsoever and sued everyone he could for perceived violations of his constitutional rights. He ultimately won a $5.8 million settlement from the Justice Department in June of 2008 for its mishandling of the case. Now, there have been several other missteps, fuck-ups, and instances of blatant misconduct along the way, including the harassment of another scientist, Perry Mikasel, who began drinking heavily and eventually died of a heart attack in October 2002. But we pick up the story in July of 2008, less than a month after the Hatfield settlement was announced. A government bioweapons sector employee named Bruce Ivins committed suicide by what was ruled an overdose of Tylenol. No one found a suicide note and no autopsy was performed. Soon after his death, the FBI broke the news to the public that Ivins had been their main suspect in the case. No public announcement of this had been made while he was alive, but in what can only be interpreted as an overtly threatening gesture. His lawyers had been told that he was about to be charged with the crimes and that the government would be seeking the death penalty. Now, why would you do that to a suspect known to be suffering from depression and other emotional disorders? Further, Ivins contended he'd been roughed up by the FBI after his therapist, a dubious character named Gene Dooley, consulted with the FBI without Ivins' knowledge and also went to a Maryland court asking for a restraining order against Ivins after he supposedly sent three threatening phone messages to her. Now, you can listen to the phone messages for yourself and see if you think they qualify as threatening. Hello, Gene. This is Bruce, and I want to thank you for getting me arrested. Dooley's affidavit for the restraining order is a curious document to say the least. It's complete with grammatical errors, misspellings of several words, including the word therapist, and also unsubstantiated claims that Ivins was homicidal or a sociopath. Her court testimony after Ivins' death included claims that he was a revenge killer, as well as other implausible things he supposedly done that would lead a reasonable observer to wonder why she hadn't done something much sooner than she did about this supposed menace to society. 
As for evidence that Ivan's was any of the things that Jean Dooley claimed, well, just her word. A person with a long arrest record, a recent DUI conviction for which she was still on probation at the time, and therefore perhaps more easily influenced by law enforcement than someone who was not under their supervision would be. This part of the FBI's case stinks rotten. And yet there's an even bigger problem with the FBI's theory of the case. In claiming that Ivan's acted alone, the Bureau is overlooking the results of a series of tests undertaken at the FBI's request in hopes of supporting its lone gunman hypothesis. The problem for the FBI's theory is simple. The anthrax used in the attacks was coated with silicon, allowing it to become a dangerous aerosol when it hits the air. But no one who worked with Ivans believes he had the skills to weaponize anthrax in this fashion. It required highly specialized equipment, for one thing, equipment Ivans had not been trained on, and equipment which did not even exist in the facility where Ivans worked. That has been confirmed by Ivan's supervisor at Fort Detrick, who was recently quoted in an article as stating, quote, we did not have the capability to add silicon compounds to anthrax spores at their place of work. Faced with this pesky fact, the FBI concocted an alternative theory to account for the presence of the silicon. They surmised it could have perhaps been the result of contamination. But the concentration of silicon in the anthrax used was very high, about 1.4%. The FBI designated a California lab to test for the possibility of accidental absorption. But try as they might, and they tried 56 times, the scientists at the lab never came close to replicating the level of silicon concentration in the weaponized anthrax. The point being, the silicon present in the anthrax used in the attacks was put there on purpose by someone who knew what they were doing. And it's virtually inconceivable that that person could have been Bruce Ivins. The case has been closed anyway. Your tax dollars are work. And so, what I'd like to ask Tom Daschle is, you still believe the FBI's theory? If so, why? Speak up, sir. The public needs to hear from you. Please, how low can you go? Death row? What a brother no once again back is the incredible rhyme animal, the uncannibal D. Public enemy number one.